This past Tuesday was Valentine's Day, and I celebrated Valentine's Day with my wife, and she was so thrilled at the fact that I had taken time to clean up the entire house and that I had gotten off of work early to pick up our children, and I prepared dinner for our children while also going and getting my wife's favorite dinner meal from her favorite restaurant, which is Village Tavern, and securing her drink of choice, which is Chick-fil-A sweet tea. And after dinner, she looked at me very seductively, and she says, Mmm, that was so good today. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Would you like a sweet treat a little bit later on tonight? If you have kids under the age of 12, would you muffle their ears just for a moment? And I'll tell you exactly how I responded. (laughs) I looked at her square in the eyes and I said, yeah, baby. I said, I'll tell you exactly what I want. I want you to tell our three kids that are four, six, and ten to sleep in their beds and not ours. (laughs) And she looked at me and she said, I doubt it. Everybody say, I doubt it. it. Say it again. Say, I doubt it. There are few things that are more frustrating than sharing a serious hope that you have with someone that you love and trust only to hear, I doubt it. Everybody say, (laughs) I doubt it. Have you ever had a dream or desire that you knew God birthed in you that he wanted you to accomplish And you sat on it for a little bit, and you went to some friends and family, and it was the moment that you were going to share that dream with them. And so you share that dream with them, and then you tell them, this is what I believe God can do. And then you ask that one question, do you think I can do it? Only to hear from that person looking back at you and saying, "Mm, I doubt it. Have you ever experienced that? Everybody say, I doubt it. There's nothing like stepping to the edge of trying to overcome your fear, but then having a voice inside of you back you off the ledge and say, mm, I doubt it. Everybody say, I doubt it. Have you ever heard something that you knew was too good to be true and your immediate response was, I doubt it. Everybody say, I doubt it. At some point in all of our lives, we will encounter doubt. We will have questions. You see, doubt comes in all shapes and sizes. And doubt makes no difference who you are and what you believe. Doubt will come for you. Today is Share Your Story Sunday, and I've got a question for you. Do you doubt that you have a story that is worth sharing? Do you feel like because you are not a crack-smoking axe murderer and you've lived a pretty good life that you just don't have a story worth sharing? There's no blip of dirt on your radar, and so therefore you have no story worth sharing. Do you feel like your story is so dirty, and there's not an ounce of good in it? And because there's not an ounce of good, you do not have a story that is worth sharing. Have you ever felt that you could not share your story because you are currently battling doubts and questions about your own faith? And you feel so uncomfortable to bring up those doubts and questions that you just feel that you can't share your story. Is your story got one part in it where you just feel so ashamed of a decision that you made? You feel so embarrassed by something you didn't do. You have guilt for maybe a sin. And you feel that because of that, you do not have a story that is worth sharing. If that is you, I'm glad that you are here today. Because the story that we're going to look at is about a man who doubted he had a story to share. Because after Jesus died, this man doubted that he believed what he used to believe. And because of that, he was branded a doubter. Would you all stand with me as we honor God by reading his word this morning? I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to the New Testament book of John. If you're new to Christianity or if you're new to reading the Bible, the New Testament is in the second part of your Bible. And we're going to be in the book of John. That's the fourth gospel. If you know those first four books of the New Testament, why don't you say them out loud with me? It's going to be fun. It begins with Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, and then John. We're in John chapter 20. And once you find your place there, I want you to put your finger on verse 25. That's where we're going to be. We're talking about a man named Thomas. Everybody say Thomas. 
Here's what you need to know about Thomas. Thomas was an uneducated fisherman from Galilee. He was an undesirable student to the modern day teachers and, fair, uh, teachers and rabbis who walked around the town looking for potential disciples. But something happened when Thomas met Jesus. Something changed in Thomas' life that caused him to want to abandon his livelihood and follow an itinerant street preacher for three years. Something happened. This is Thomas' story. This is what he saw. This is what he heard. This is what he experienced. Thomas was there in the boat when Jesus walked on the water. Thomas was there in the boat when Jesus calmed the raging sea. Thomas was there whenever Jesus miraculously made the lame walk. He was there whenever Jesus called the dead back to life and ushered them out of the grave. Thomas was there and he heard Jesus as he prophesied his own arrest, his death, and his resurrection. That was all a part of Thomas' story. He saw that. He felt that. He experienced that. And because he saw what God did in the lives of so many other people, he had no doubts that he was following the Savior of the world. But this is also part of Thomas' story. On the same weekend that Jesus died, Thomas saw a bloodied and bruised Jesus. And he experienced the loss and the separation of the one who at a time had called him friend. That's also part of his story. Thomas was faithfully following Jesus. And then all of a sudden, in a quick turn of events, his world flips upside down. And he's starting to have questions and doubts about what he truly believes. Here's how our story begins today. So it's been days after the death of Jesus and the disciples are gathered in a tiny room to try and process what they have just experienced. They've locked the door because they're afraid that the angry religious leaders will find them out and do the same thing to them that was done to Jesus. When all of a sudden, Jesus, the risen Christ, appears right in the middle of the room with them. And in a moment, things change. you got to imagine these disciples are rubbing their eyes. There is no doubt questions and doubts raised in that moment. But Jesus confirms who he is. And then after their experience, these disciples had a story that they wanted to share. This picture-perfect moment had but one problem. You see, all the disciples were present in that room except one disciple, and his name was Thomas. And we don't know the reason why he wasn't there. We don't know the story around what was going on in Thomas's mind, but we do know this. After the disciples had encountered the risen Christ, the first person that they went to go look for was a man named Thomas. Everybody say Thomas. Thomas. And whenever they found him, they all started shouting, we've seen the risen Christ. We have, have encountered the risen Lord. Let us tell you about it. And this is what Thomas says to those disciples. And we pick up in John chapter 20, verse 25. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Everybody say, I will not believe. That is a bold statement, a very bold statement. Eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, but this time Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Hey, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Say that. Say stop doubting, stop doubting. and believe. Say that. Yes. Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. Can you imagine the story that Thomas gets to share now? Because he has personally encountered the risen Christ. It wasn't a pretty story. It was a story that was marked by failure and his obedience faith and doubt and so much more, but this is his story. I don't know the story that God is writing in your life, but I know that God is writing a story. And it may not be perfect the way that you see it as perfect. It may not be good. It might be marked with all dirt and just a little blob of goodness. It might be all good and just a little speck of dirt, but it is a story that God is writing. It is a story that God wants to use so that he can allow other people to come to know Jesus through you. Say through me. So here's what I'd like for us to do. Let's talk today about how we can share to Jesus our doubts and share our story to others. 
so they can come to know Christ as we know Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are bigger than my doubts. God, I thank you so much for not running away from my questions. God, thank you that you do not fear what I fear. Thank you that your faithfulness is not changed because of my lack of faith. So I ask you today, Jesus, that you would soften our hearts to believe in you, to trust in you with all of our doubts and with our entire story. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. As you're making your way to your seat, I want you to high-five four people, and I want you to say to them, my doubt is not the end of my story. High-five four people and say, my doubt is not the end of my story. My doubt is not the end of my story. Let's say this again. Say, my doubt is not the end of my story. Amen. Do you believe that? Doubt is not the end of faith. I think you need to hear that today. The doubt that you process, the doubt that you experience is not the end of your faith. You see, doubt is actually an invitation to push through some of the honest questions that you may have so that you can experience a depth of faith that God desires for you. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. Let me say that again. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. There are well-intentioned believers in Jesus who will advise you and me not to have an ounce of doubt in your heart because if you do, then you're not saved. You're not following Jesus. You're not going to heaven. But I actually believe that doubt is not the enemy of faith. I think that doubt is actually a key component of faith because here's what can happen. Doubt forces us to deconstruct the things that we have believed that are actually untrue so that we can reconstruct a fresh framework of faith built on the things that we now know to be absolutely true because of our fresh encounters, because of our fresh understanding. Faith is doubting your doubt. Say that when we say faith is doubting your doubt. You see, whenever you doubt your doubts, one of two things is going to happen. Either your belief in God is going to conform to the circumstances that are in front of you because you doubt your faith, or your circumstances in front of you are going to conform to your belief in God because you doubt your doubts. Faith is doubting your doubts. This is another way how I would describe what doubt is. Doubt is putting your circumstances between you and God. That is doubt. Doubt is looking at this through the lens of here I am, there's God, let me tell you my problems through the lens of my circumstances, the reality that's in front of you, the doubts that I have, the questions that I hold. Look how distant God is in the midst of this. That is doubt. This is faith. Faith is putting God in between you and your circumstances. God is looking at your circumstances and the realities that's in front of you and telling it who your God is. It's telling it what God can do for you. It is telling you what God has done for you. That is faith. You see, your doubts don't have to distance you from God. They can actually draw you closer to God. Whenever, when I was a youth pastor here at this church in a lifetime long ago, I would often get texts and phone calls from parents who were scared to death because their children and their students and teenagers were starting to raise questions of doubts about their faith. And these parents were scared because they did not have the answers to these questions. Truth be told, neither did I. But I had a wise youth pastor that taught me a couple things. And so here's what I would share with you, and it stands true today. So if you have children, or if you are raising soon-to-be teenagers, or if you have teenagers and they are battling questions of doubt, questions of faith, then here's what I would encourage you to do. Number one, whenever your kids come to you with their questions, this is not a time to panic. This is a time to help them process. Okay, this is a time for you to help them process. 
You see, your home should be the safest place for your kids to ask the hardest questions. This church, your church, should be the safest place for your kids to ask the hardest questions. This is the way I picture how a home should be. Your home should be like a gym, like a place where you go to work out so that your children can safely work out their faith. Your home should be like a gym where your children can safely go and work out their faith. And let me explain what I mean by that. Science has proven that if you go and work out with a partner, then you're more likely to actually go back because you enjoy the conversation, you enjoy the activity a little bit more, and you're more likely to stay connected in that phase of working out. Just like our faith, your kids need a workout partner. And if you as a parent don't sign up to be the first one to be their, first, their, their, their partner, then somebody else will. And so you need to make sure you're the first one to sign up as your kids' faith workout partner. You and your kids need to be a part of a good gym, a.k.a. a good church. You need to actively partner with your church. I didn't say actively drop them off and come and attend a lecture and then leave. I said actively partner with your church. You need to be a part of a good kids ministry, a good student ministry, a good young adults ministry. But maybe good's not good enough because good is the enemy of great. Maybe we're looking for something where life change is happening regularly. Well, I'm glad that you showed up here today. And if you are not plugged into a place, let me go ahead and tell you that we have some incredible directors that God is working in and working through for you, for your children. But again, that's what we're doing on the church side of things. Partnership involves you as a parent. It means that there's something that you have got to pick up. It means there's something that your children have to pick up. If you regularly bring your children to church over the course of a year, we will be blessed to be able to steward them towards the ways of Jesus for 40 hours a year. That's incredible. And we make sure that every one of those 40 hours a year is packed with truth, is packed with experiencing Jesus, is packed with helping them connect with other believers who are just a road ahead of them or right there around them so they can process their questions or doubt. But here's what you need to know. 40 hours is not enough because as parents, you have more than 3,000 hours of influence that you can share with your kids over the course of the year. So we are at a disproportionately lower level than what you have as a parent. So you have to partner with us because no doubt your kids, if they're like mine, won't listen whenever you ask them to follow and obey. But they'll listen to somebody else who's echoing the exact same thing, just in a different environment. So you need to find a good gym, a good church, and you need to partner with it. The next thing I would say to you is you need to get your kids the right workout clothes. It's good enough for them to borrow your workout clothes for a little while, but eventually they've got to own theirs. I don't know how long you can allow your kid to borrow your faith before you start saying, hey, I need you to own your faith. You need to push them out so that they are starting to own not your faith, but own their faith. The next thing I would say is you need to teach them not to just go to the gym, but you need to teach them how to work the gym. That means that you have got to model everything for your kids because if it is not in you, it will not be in them. Which means that this, this is the first thing. You teach them that God's word is the first source of truth for everything and everything else is secondary. You teach them how to study God's word. You teach them the value of scripture memorization. You teach them the value of hiding God's truth in your heart. You teach them how to tell their story of faith. And while you're at it, why don't you sit down and ask them, hey, tell me about your faith. And you sit there and you listen. But then tell them why you believe. Tell them the doubts that you've got. Tell them the questions that are still lingering. Tell them about the times whenever you took a leap of faith and you failed but God met you in that failure and walked with you. Tell them how you want to see them take a leap, but you know whenever they leap, whether they jump and they make it or they jump and they fall, God is with them in the process. And the last thing I would say is you need to make working out part of your daily life with your family and active faith with your family. If you want your home to be a place where kids can safely go and talk, then you need to treat it like a gym. You see, you cannot make your children believe, but you can make it difficult for them to doubt. So, good. 
So here's what's happening. The disciples, back to the story. Here's what's happening. The disciples are running to Thomas because they have got the greatest story that they could share. And if you don't know what that story is, let me just take a moment and let me tell you what it is. That God left heaven. He chose to leave heaven. And he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin. But not born in human nature with sin, but born with a divine nature because he's God. And he lived a perfect and he lived a sinless life for you and for me. And then one day he took on your sin, your shame, your guilt, past, present, and future for all of us so that you and I could get an opportunity to know him as Savior, to know him as Lord, and to live with him for all of eternity. But more than that, if he just died, this story is over. Jesus conquered death. He conquered the devil. And he conquered the grave for you and for me. And so the truth is, he rose from the grave. And this is the story that the disciples are going to find Thomas and tell them, right? But the disciples have experienced, they have encountered Jesus, and Thomas has not. So Thomas looks at those disciples and he says, unless I see. Everybody say, unless I see. You and I, if we look deep within our lives, will find those unless I see moments. We will find those. But here's what you need to know. Jesus knows them. And he doesn't want us to stay in that moment. He wants us to keep walking forward with him, continually extending trust so that you and I can invite God's Holy Spirit into our lives so that we can come to grips with the doubts and questions that you and I walk through. Thomas says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, the doubts are not going anywhere. Verse 26. I don't know what happens between verse 25 and verse 26, but we get a gap of about eight days. If you are dealing with doubt, and you are dealing with doubt and isolation, that's a dangerous place to find yourself. Because the devil can use doubt to disarm you, and disarm God's active work in you, and deceive you from following his way and his will. That's why you need community. That's apparently what I'm reading into is what happened with Thomas. Because eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, But this time, say, but this time. But this time, Thomas was with them. And through the locked doors, Jesus came and he stood among them. Amen. And then Jesus looks around and he skips over all the other disciples until he finds the one who desires to believe. And that's what Jesus does whenever he encounters you. He looks for you where you're at in your desire to believe him. And listen to what Jesus says to this doubter. He says, put your finger here, see my hands? And then he says, reach out your hand and put it into my side. He says, stop doubting and believe. You see, first, Jesus gives us an invitation. He gives that to Thomas and he gives that to you And he gives that to me. And then he gives us an imperative. He says, stop doubting and believe. And then Jesus initiates restoration. You see, Jesus wants Thomas to know that he's reached the end of this quest. That the answer to our doubts is not in a set of principles, but it is in the sight of a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus does not withdraw from Thomas, and he will not withdraw from you either. You and I are not the sum total of all the worst moments of our life because we are known for who we are. We are loved for who we are, and we are wanted by the God who created all of us, you included, and your enemies. He meets you where you are, beckoning doubters to come and see, to look at the facts of his resurrection, his proof of his deity, but more importantly, to give you peace to give you forgiveness, and to show you his mercy. And Thomas has no other response except to exclaim, my Lord and my God. 
And there's an exclamation point on there. So it's not something soft. It is something that he is experiencing. And I imagine it was a moment of worship that happened there. Thomas's words are a powerful declaration of faith. This is a full surrender. Thomas is saying, you can have everything, Lord. Whatever I had, it is now yours because I am giving it all up to follow you again. This is the story of Thomas. He says, Jesus is not a failed prophet. He is not some disillusioned revolutionary. He is both the Lord of creation, the God of the universe, and in this moment, in this story, he is the Lord and Savior to Thomas. If it is true that Jesus rose from the grave, if it is true that the scars that he bore on Calvary are still the scars that he bears today, then we have no other option except to live for the one who died for us. Okay? So I'll invite the band to come up and let me share with you my story. It is easy for me to believe for miracles for you guys. Every single week, I am blessed with the opportunity to pray with people like you. Pray for the miraculous. Pray for those that are down and out. Pray for those moments like a sick puppy. But it is difficult at times for me to believe that God can do the miraculous in me and through me and for my family. And so I struggle with doubt. Three months ago, though, on a very crisp November night, my wife Jade had a moment with a miraculous. See, my wife Jade called me after attending a revival service, and she said, I believe my back has just been completely healed. See, let me give you a little bit of context. For the past three years, my wife has experienced very debilitating back pain uh, that has robbed her of the joy of motherhood, that has robbed her of freedom of motion and ability. It's robbed her of precious moments with her friend and the smile and laughter that has always defined her. But after three years of pain, following even a spinal fusion surgery with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tear-filled prayers and her constant pain, she had a moment with the miraculous. But to say that I was skeptical of this situation and skeptical that this situation would change would be a big understatement. See, with my words, I was telling my wife and my children, yes, I believe. But the deepest parts of my heart, I'm saying, I doubt it. But whenever Jay came home that night, something different was going on. You see, whenever Jay came in, she had this smile that I hadn't seen in years. She went and grabbed her running shoes, and she ran a mile and a half in our neighborhood. And she walked in with more of a smile, with a bigger joy. And I said, what's going on? And then I saw her do something I've not seen her do in years. She then picked up each and every one of our three children, and she spun them around. And I said, what is going on? You're going to hurt yourself. And she said, no, something's different. For three years, my wife's not been able to lift up our children. I would see her lay down on the couch, and I'd have to bring them to her, or they would go lay down on top of her, but she's not been able to do that. She's not been able to lift them up. You see, what should have been a moment of extreme celebration was actually a moment of big hesitation on my part. You see, because seeing her in this moment actually brought more questions and more doubts because I didn't see the healing firsthand. I only heard about it secondhand from people who were involved. So again, out loud, I'm saying, yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe. But in the deepest part of my heart, so I'm saying, I doubt it. So it just so happened that eight days later, say eight days later. It just so happened that eight days later, I had a personal trip planned to the beach. I love the beach. It's a great place that I go to process. And on the first night that I was there, I was walking along the seashore. It was late at night. It was really, really dark. I couldn't see anything except whatever I could see with the glow of my flashlight. And I'm praying to God, and I'm just being honest. I said, God, I don't know why I'm a pastor, because I have such great doubts. I said, I don't know what you're doing right now, but I'm really struggling to believe that you have healed my wife. I said, I apologize. I confess my unbelief. 
and I need you to show me that you have healed my wife. I said, I need to see something that's awe-inspiring. I couldn't even finish my prayer, and I took one step, and I just happened to look up, and I saw something that was glowing over the horizon that was bright yellow, bright red, and bright orange. And the only words that I personally have to describe what it looked like was it looked like there was a nuclear explosion happened just up North Myrtle Beach. And I thought, oh, great, I've only got seconds to live. <laughs> it took me literally two minutes to identify that this was the moon that was rising in the horizon of the ocean. I have seen sunsets and sunrises. I have never seen a moon rise so big, so bright, and so personal. And in a moment where I say, God, I want to see something awe-inspiring, I take one step, and this is what I get. So I begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because you have just confirmed to me that you have healed my wife. And then I went back to the house, and I called my wife, and I told her exactly what I'd experienced. But I woke up the next morning with more doubt and more questions in my life. Because I thought, uh, well, I've never honestly had a prayer answered that fast. So maybe that was just circumstance. So I decide that later on this day, I'm going to go back out, do the same walk, same time again, and I'm going to say the same prayer. So I did. 1030 at night, walking along the beach, can't see anything except what my flashlight shows. And I said, God, forgive me for my doubt. Forgive me for not believing in you. Forgive me for not trusting you. Prove to me that my wife is healed. I said, but let me add a caveat. I want to see a shooting star. Before I could finish that prayer, there were 10 shooting stars that came from behind me to over me to in front of me. They were bright white, bright green, bright yellow. It looked like somebody had packed up their South Carolina 4th of July fireworks and set them off right there behind me. That's exactly what it looked like. And I dropped to my knees and I wept. I wept. And I was like, I am so sorry that I do not believe in you like I should. Thank you for helping me in my unbelief. And I went back to the house. But the next morning I woke up and I had even greater fears, greater questions, and great, greater doubts. I hear you. I hear you. I said, Jesus, why me? But this morning I had to leave. I had to leave the beach to come back home. And so I said, you know what? I'm not going out at night to pray. I'm going this morning, and I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And so I went, and I walked along the beach in the opposite direction. It was a cold and windy and rainy day. It was miserable. I could look a mile in both directions and count the number of people who were walking on two hands. That was it. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm praying, and I'm crying out to God. I'm like, God, forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for my doubt. Forgive me for not trusting in you, but I need proof that you have healed my wife. I said, I need proof that you are giving me the ability to walk forward in faith so that I can help launch this next campus of Renaissance Church. I need to know that you are with me in the midst of this. And immediately I said amen, and a woman walks up to me. And she says, I don't know why I'm doing this. She said, I wouldn't even classify myself as a believer in God, but I am here to tell you that God is telling me to tell you that your storm is over. So I stand up, and I look at this woman that's barely standing over five feet tall, and I said, what did you say to me? It probably looked like I was about to mug her. But I needed reassurance that she had heard from God. I said, what did you say? She said, your storm is over. And it was exactly what I was praying for. Here's what I want to tell you. Jesus met me where I was, not once, not twice, but three times, immediately. And he gave me exactly what I needed. I needed evidence. I needed kindness. And Jesus praises those people who believe without seeing, but he doesn't scold you and he doesn't scold me for wanting proof of his miraculous. So here's the deal. That's my story. It's messy. And honestly, for me, it feels embarrassing to expose me as a failure of my own faith. But it's also been a catalyst for incredible spiritual growth over the past three months. And it's one of the reasons why I am willing to live 
for the one who died for me.